That is a serious issue. Yes. Uh, it's a serious safety issue yes. uh, across experimental aviation, not just sonics. And no two home-built airplanes are alike. As hard as we yeah. try, as standardized as the kits have become. And people looking at barnstormers and seeing, you know, the, the $15,000 sonics need to understand this, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of hidden costs to a great deal. I could make a fourth part video talking about uh, used Sonics and uh, secondhand owners and, <laughs> and that kind of stuff. I mean, not, not to rant. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's serious. It is a serious issue. Yes. Uh, it's a serious safety issue uh, yes. across experimental aviation, not just Sonics. And that's a, a big focus of some of my work on like the EAA safety committee mm -hmm. is, um, you know, things like the flight test manual that are not only valid for, um, uh, a new home build that's newly flying, but if you bought in a home build, you mm -hmm. should probably go through at least uh, uh, a few key test flight cards and yeah. to get to know your airplane because no two home built airplanes are alike. As hard as we yeah. try, as standardized as the kits have become, there's still um, unique snowflakes of airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, because everyone's built by a different builder and built mm -hmm. differently and to varying levels of quality. Uh, we all know <laughs> well, the uh, FAA inspection for your airworthiness is more of a paperwork exercise than it is a quality inspection. So you have to continue to use your EAA technical counselors mm -hmm. and your builder communities and technical support offered by manufacturers to make sure that you're building the airplane properly. And when you buy a used one, you have to be really careful to inspect it uh, I highly recommend the book, the new book from Vic Syracuse about inspecting and pre-buy inspections on experimental aircraft okay. and other resources like the, uh, he's got two books, actually, one of them is on kind of maintenance focus, and the other one is all about pre-buy inspections for uh, experimental aircraft. Also, an FAA publication that's actually been out for a long time, but recently it kind of has been long forgotten. And it's the first time I saw this great document called Plain Sense. Okay. And um, it's geared mostly towards certified airplanes, but there's a lot of really valuable stuff in there even for the experimental aircraft owner. Um, so I would direct people to that as well. Dan, I mean, I guess the only other component to that is flight training and transition training. And, and insurance and all that. That's a major, a major challenge. Yes. Um, you know, we used to have our own flight training operation. And that's actually a large part of what Joe Norris did for us. When he went, went back to EAA, well, we didn't have a flight instructor on staff. And, you know, we, we ran a pretty successful transition training program, but it wasn't perfect. Um, manufacturers are not necessarily the best suited to do flight training. Um, and, you know, there are other things that, you know, if I was to do it again, we would definitely have like a, an SMS in place. Um, and, you um, you know, we would probably want to need a, a larger fleet of factory prototypes that are on a very disciplined uh, SMS style uh, maintenance program. And the bottom line is the big, the big challenge there is insurance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is where I have got a big beef with the aircraft insurance companies. Everybody knows that the insurance market in aviation and elsewhere has quote unquote hardened. Mm -hmm. uh, rates are going way up and it's harder to get uh, someone to write you a policy. But at the same time, for many years, even before the market really hardened, the insurance companies and the FAA and of course EAA um, and manufacturers have wanted people to get experimental transition training mm -hmm. and uh, through LOTA programs and what have you. The problem is, is that the insurance companies have raised the rates for CFIs to give that instruction yeah. to the point where it doesn't pay to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got a... You know, you, you picture your typical Sonics or RV or whatever owner that uh, is a CFI and maybe wants to help out five or 10 guys a year, if that, to get their transition training to ensure their new Sonics. Um, it's not their full-time gig. And um, to pay for the insurance for that, it just isn't worthwhile. So there are fewer and fewer people out there who can justify the expense of giving that training, which is a major safety problem. It is, it absolutely and, is. And so, you know, if the insurance companies, you know, they gotta put their money where their mouth is, which is an impossible ask, because you're never gonna tell um, an actuary or an underwriter uh, what to do or what to charge. But that's what really needs to happen if we want more transition training to yeah. take place. Yeah.
I was talking about insurance, you know, I went through this too, where, okay, I'd like to get the coverage for it, but the, not everybody, but certain companies came back and said, okay, well, you need five hours of dual instruction, which in my airplane with my weight isn't exactly practical. Right. Uh, it's good, but it's not practical. Right. Um, and the instructor has to have 25 hours time and type, which isn't a lot. But how many CFIs out there actually have that? And That's hard to come by. It is. It really is. Much time in a Sonics, unless they own one. Mm -hmm. And um, and then yeah, I mean the Sonics is a limited size of airplane, and you, you can't always fit uh, certain combinations of pilot and instructor in the airplane. You know, the other thing too is that the insurance companies years ago used to accept uh, time in your logbook and similar handling aircraft. Yes. Times. Yep. The Sonics Builders and Pilots Foundation transition training syllabus does discuss that. And there are a lot of really good airplanes that can very closely simulate what it's like to fly a Sonics, whether that be even, a, you know, a Vans RV, like an RV6 or something, or, um, uh, you know, a Grumman Yankee or, or other types that, um, you know, and the other thing too is orientation time and type. In other words, time flown with another Sonics builder who isn't a CFI. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, you're probably not doing takeoffs and landings, but at least you're feeling the airplane out in the sky. And, you know, in the early days of Sonics, we had people jumping in the Sonics from 152s and 172s with no transition training whatsoever because, you know, maybe they were the first or the second or the or the tenth builder to actually get in a Sonics finished and flying. Yeah. And, you know, it is an incredibly easy and intuitive airplane to fly. It just... Mm -hmm. You got to use your head yeah. uh, getting into any new airplane and, um, and, and feel it out. Well, and that's what I, I had an hour in a YX before I got my plane flying. And I tell you what, it was eye opening. I learned an awful lot in a hurry. I, I didn't do the takeoff or the landing. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> but just even that control feel at speed. And, you know, I did slow flight, I did stalls, just getting that feel opened up everything and it wasn't necessarily the the preferred transition training or anything but i'm much happier i did that than nothing so. right absolutely and you know the airplane the, the sonics is a very is not a difficult airplane to fly oh, it didn't even intimidate you but like any new airplane you should respect it mm -hmm. and um you know and our tail wheels are the same they're probably the easiest tail dragger you'll ever fly Agreed. i don't hear about ground loops and sonics and stuff um, but that being said, you still need a tailwind enforcement mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to go fly something much more difficult uh, in terms of a conventional tailwind airplane, Cessna 140 or, or something like that. And then you'll come and fly the Sonics and you're going to get all the fusses about. Um, but yeah, you got to make sure you're prepared yeah. and, uh, and making safe choices. The other thing too that I tell people is, you know, don't try to ensure your Sonics with, you know, full all risk movement, you know, in flight Hull insurance. Mm -hmm. That's just ridiculous. You know, you built the airplane, you should be able to repair it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cover your liability yeah, so yeah, that you yeah. can be responsible, uh, a responsible citizen out there yeah. in the sky. But, you know, that's really all you need. You know, maybe non movement hull for if the fuel truck runs into your airplane on the ground. Or we have a tornado come, come through once every 20 years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Through John Toon Airport or something like that. <laughs> But, um, you know, look, especially in the beginning until you can build more time in your airplane, um, go the least expensive route and just do liability only. And um, I, don't ever, I don't ever recommend flying naked with no insurance, although I know some people do it. Mm -hmm. um, but at least get liability, fly for a while, build up your time in the airplane, and then go back to the insurance company and they'll be much easier to work with. Yeah, I, I've known people that had incidents and not even having liability and they they lost everything or, or pretty close to everything and you know 10 20 years down the road they're still struggling from it it's it's not worth it in my opinion so yeah i mean i fly my ultralight naked but that's because no one would ever insure an ultralight <laughs> and you know it's a kite i mean if i went into yeah. anything i won't even hurt myself <laughs> you know maybe damage a corner of the crop but yeah. um, that's affordable yeah, I, I propose to multiple insurance companies, you know, the, the similar type aircraft. And at this moment, every single one of them says no. Yeah, and that's that's a it's change. I mean, that's 
only in the last few years that they're saying no to them because they used to accept that all the time. And it really makes a lot of sense, but they've gotten so hard line on it. But at the same time, they, uh, they aren't allowing the, the, uh, the activity to really happen from a, from a financial standpoint when it comes to what they're charging CFIs to give that instruction. So that's, that's my beef with the insurance company, um, uh, companies, the industry in general. I don't see a practical fix um, until you get somebody with enough clout to, uh, to take notice yeah. and make a change. And I unfortunately just don't see that happen. Yeah. Well, and that's something I'll, I'll take a moment to further promote your local EAA chapter. Uh, you know, we mentioned the flight test manual. My chapter gifted me one once I got close to uh, my first flight in the airplane. Um, and even being able to fly with other guys and other experimentals, you know, like, let's say like a Rans S7, it's, it's not the exact same thing, but it helps. It's stick time. It's something more responsive than your, say your Cessna and everything building up to that moment helped. So yeah, it gets you oriented, gets you in the same territory, gets you oriented to the general situation. So join your local EAA chapter. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, cool, Mark. I actually, I did have that as a side question, and I, I wasn't going to put it in, but I'm glad we covered it. This is this is great. So yeah. it's, it needs to be said. And, it, and people looking at barnstormers and seeing, you know, the, the $15,000 Sonics need to understand this, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of hidden costs to a great deal, yeah. um, especially to get a hold of the real basket case project. I and mean, we've our web, we've got that page on our web page website that goes through all of that. And those are all real scenarios. And there are many more that we had, that we didn't, haven't written about. Mm. And there, some of them are really eye opening. Uh, I recall one airplane that was built, was bought by someone. It looked like a quote unquote great airplane and a quote unquote great deal. And then he realized that none of the wing ribs were riveted to the main spar. Oh. They're riveted to the skins. Um, oh. And the skin was riveted to the spar, but the ribs were not riveted to the spar. Wow. And the airplane had been flying. And so there's some stuff out there. And, you know, wow. those are things that, you know, an FAA airworthiness inspector are not immediately going to catch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you just, I don't care what kind of airplane you're buying, if it's experimental, um, you have to do your diligence and yeah. make sure that it's a solid Absolutely. And I, you know, I'll freely admit here, uh, I don't think I did enough, <laughs> honestly. I, I don't think I fully understood the situation. You know, I thought I did enough research. I thought I did enough looking into my airplane, but I definitely learned a lot more about it afterwards. Um, and I put a lot of time into it, you know, before ever taking it to the airport. That's something I, I definitely learned from this experience with mine is yeah you, you've got to put a lot more time and effort into it and research that's that's true and that's you know i learned from my experience with my airplane last year that i bought used from somebody who built it and it was I mean, like i said i think it was a fuel system issue but you know the airplane was overdue and having the fuel system just completely replaced and um and i should have done it but i was excited <laughs> and I was really i was really having a great, great time flying. And I didn't want to take the airplane down for maintenance until yeah. like winter. Yeah. And of course, you know, that got forced upon me way before the flying season was over. And <laughs> could have been a lot worse. And yeah, so, absolutely. yeah, I mean, those are the tales, the cautionary tales that everybody needs to be mindful of and don't let your enthusiasm and your excitement uh, get in the way of uh, making uh, good, uh, safe decisions. Absolutely, absolutely. And like I said, a lot of my viewers are potential experimental or sonics buyers you know they're they're looking at it for the first time and you know maybe they they learned in a 150 or whatever maybe they've owned a cherokee and now they're looking at experimental so i'm glad we covered a lot of things that we did I, I, it's a different animal and, and you know we as an industry and especially for eaa um we're trying to get experimental airplanes to a place where there's more standardized things like mm -hmm. um pilot operating handbooks and uh, maintenance manuals and, and, and things. And, you know, although they're not certified airplanes, we're trying to treat and operate them as if they were um, and get more standardization. Mm -hmm. And the flight test manual is a big component to that. You know, if you, you know, let's say you are, um, we're working on version two of the flight test manual now, mm -hmm. actually. But let's say you're going to buy a, um, a used Sonics and you're looking at two different airplanes out there and one of them has got a completely filled out 
phase one, according to the EAA flight test manual and everything's documented. And the other plane, uh, the guy just went and bored holes in the sky for 40 hours or maybe <laughs> 30 hours and then pencil whipped the last 10 hours. Um, which airplane are you going to buy? Oh yeah. 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 You know, so, you know, I think some, you know, I, we could even start getting into things like, you know, certified used, although, you know, that's, we don't have the space <laughs> <with> the <laughs> staff to bring used airplanes in and inspect them and work on them. And yeah, resell them. I wouldn't want that liability. Either. I wouldn't want that liability <laughs> either, but you know, the idea that, you know, um, barnstormers or other classifieds maybe should have a field in their form that says, you know, has this, has this airplane gone through the EAA flight test manual? Yeah. yeah. Has it gone through this program or that kind of program? Was it built using technical counselors for, for inspection and advice? Those are all things that would make the fleet safer as a whole, or at least help direct people to safer, uh, better constructed airplanes and better tested airplanes. And, and you touched on it too, you know, and I, I, I look at it the same way with Craigslist with like, you know, motorcycles, cars, whatever you're buying the builder or the most recent owner as much as you are the aircraft or the item, you know, how they treated it over their time. That's what you're getting. And right. you, you better, you better do an inspection of them too. And if you see any signs you don't like, it will walk away. Yeah. So. Well, the other big thing with the home built airplane, and this is kind of a culture shift. Um, you know, we see a lot more interest, pretty much every phone call and email I get is asking invariably about quick build kits. Mm -hmm. Um, which is great. I mean, obviously it's been a big boon to our business, but, you know, at the same time, it's, you know, it's a shift in the builder culture and um, builders or used experimental aircraft owners, they have to recognize the need to get themselves up to speed in learning about the airplane and how it's built and how it's maintained. Um, because it's not like a certified airplane. You have to, you really have to arm yourself with as much knowledge as you possibly can mm -hmm. about your home built airplane. Um, and, uh, and that's the only way that you're going to ensure, um, some safety. And, you know, I don't run into this all the time where builders, uh, you know, will treat an experimental airplane like a means to an end. It's a great performing airplane for a great price. I really would rather not build it, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to build it, or I'm going to pay somebody to build it, or I'm going to buy a used one. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily who we're looking for as a customer because, those are the people that tend to, to not be successful in their build or to end up with safety safety issues. Now, there's exceptions to every rule. I mean, right. was, life happens. You know, like, I can tell that you're taking your used aircraft project and you're treating it very responsibly. And that's what Thank we you. want to see. Thank you. Um, and, um, but, you know, more, you know, even with that, it's like, you know, even if you're buying a quick build kit, you need to be open to the idea that, this build process should be somewhat enjoyable. I mean, that's the whole point of the sport um, is the enjoyment of building and the things that you learn from it. And so it is a learning experience and you should embrace it as that mm -hmm. and enjoy the process, enjoy the build. We have lots of serial builders out there who come yes, back and yeah. build multiple airplanes or hop between different manufacturers and different models and done several home build airplanes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's great. I mean, that's the heart and soul of home building and the EAA culture yeah it's still building something is still on my list and that's uh that's what i wanted to do but uh my wife was clear you don't have the time and <laughs> right now with a at that time an eight month old and all that is like you're just going to get frustrated and so yeah it's like reality I, check she's right yeah absolutely absolutely so that's the logo that's the <laughs> <reality>. <laughs>